All right, so thank you, Jan. I see that inflation is not a fashionable topic because uh, half of the room is empty. <laughs> yeah, they prefer to have lunch. Okay, well, uh, inflation now is back in the vanguard. Uh, when I did my first and almost only job interview to get a position at the University of Ottawa, my presentation was about the post keynesian theory of inflation. Then I wrote a paper in 1985 on that topic, and then uh, nothing <laughs> except for whatever I put in the textbook. And then, as you can see, this is my sixth presentation about inflation uh, over the last year and a half. Uh, of course, you, uh, you know that inflation has been uh, rising well, now it's going back downward a bit, but everywhere, whether it's, it's in uh, industrial countries or other uh, countries. So there must be something uh, which is common to, to all this. I'll, I'll start by uh, presenting yeah, maybe, th maybe that's the most important slide, so maybe I should wait a bit. <laughs> Talk about fencing. Yeah, of course. Uh, <laughs> well, about fencing, there's a big controversy whether the Russians should participate or not in the world championships <laughs> in fencing. But the president of the Fencing Association, International Fencing Association is a Russian, so it's a little bit, and he, he is one of those rich Russians, so he gives a lot of money to the International Federation of Fencing. Very well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, right, so post keynesian inflation theory in a nutshell. So I wanted you to know uh, from the very start what it's all about. And one can argue that there are three main possible causes of inflation. So the first one is conflictual inflation. So the struggle over relative income shares. There's a conflict between workers and the firms or even with the rentiers, those that uh, receive interest payments. And then, but then there's also wage-wage inflation, the, the fact that people want to keep their uh, relative wage up relative to others. So there's a wage hierarchy. The second element is imported inflation, and you can find this uh, in most of the papers or books on post Keynesian economics. Uh, and the reason is then that there's a lot of, of inflation which comes from imported uh, raw materials. And as uh, si Paolo Silos Labini said in 1979, a, there's a trilateral conflict of interest between workers, industrialists, and the producers of raw materials. Finally, uh, also as a, a, a key fact in post Keynesian economics, aggregate demand plays some role, but only a mitigated role. So uh, most of us so believe that um, that's not the key element in explaining inflation, although it may play some role. Um, you, one can say that post keynesian inflation theory is Kaliskian. So here I have a long statement by uh, Mikhail Kaletsky, where in the first paragraph he insists that, uh, well, there are two kinds of uh, markets, so to speak. And on the one hand, uh, you have changes in the prices of finished goods, which are cost determined. And then on the other hand, you have the prices of raw materials, including food, uh, which are demand determined. So those 
prices of raw materials will have an impact uh, on other prices, but it's always through the cost channel. Um, you can read the, uh, quickly the rest of uh, Kaleski's uh, statement. So he, he does insist that you really have to take that into account. And also at the very bottom, he mentions the fact that these raw materials uh, can also be subjected to uh, speculative demand. So that may also play a role for these goods. Oops, wrong thing. Better push this. Uh, as most of you would know, this is how Kaletsky saw uh, the cost. Well, here, here we have the marginal cost curve. So he thought that for a lot of the level, uh, for most of the relevant level of output, the marginal cost is completely uh, fixed. And it's only when you go beyond normal capacity or uh, full capacity output that the marginal cost rises. And at the same time, so this comes from 1939, and at the same time in Oxford you also have a similar kind of presentation. Here you have both the uh, horizontal line which is the average direct cost and uh, the downward sloping one which is the average unit cost or average total cost, which takes into consideration overhead, average overhead cost. And this would be true up to full capacity output. And so th this is also crucial in our understanding of uh, how inflation can occur. Um, right, domestic demand versus world demand. Um, so here I have various statements uh, that uh, insist that the, the commodity prices play uh, an important role in explaining domestic inflation, um, but that these uh, prices are determined on world markets. So uh, the consequence of that is that monetary authorities have no or little control over one of the main sources of price inflation in a country. Um, so what happens is that uh, the, you know, if a single central bank tries to control inflation, it will be, it will, it's unlikely to be very su successful because that inflation, in fact, may be coming from uh, increasing prices of raw materials or commodities which are determined in world markets. So if we, you want to kill inflation, you need all central banks to do the same, and for instance, by raising interest rates. And here you have a, a study that was done by Perry and Klein, uh, Klein showing that uh, the reason for which we had the great moderation in Europe and in the US uh, was because of falling commodity prices and not so much because the Fed or whatever other central bank was uh, so smart. Um. Okay, so uh, what are the inductive causes of inflation? Where I have already mentioned fairness is something very important. So on the one hand, you have fairness, and on the other hand, you have market forces. Uh, this is the distinction that is, was put forward by Adrian Wood a long time ago. So on the one hand, you have r real wage resistance, uh, which means that uh, workers are targeting a, a level of their real wage. And uh, this was uh, proposed in particular uh, by my former co-author, uh, Wynne Godley. Or it was argued that uh, they will fight over real wages because they realized that in the previous periods, 
profits have been very high, have been too high, and this is uh, what Kaldor used to uh, argue, and Hicks and Kalitsky as well. And then there is the issue of the relative wage, which I have already mentioned. So that's the wage-wage inflation, and this was uh, mentioned by Keynes, John Robinson, Richard Kahn in his presentation to the Ratcliffe Commission uh, back in 1958. And then how, how does, uh, well, you need some information in order to, I mean, if you want to compare your real wage to some other, to the real wages of, say, uh, butchers or uh, farm, farmen or whatever, uh, then you, you do need information. And here I found this statement by Paul Davidson, which is uh, highly uh, critical where he says the increasingly readily information on the earnings of others has created pressures which make wage price inflation the most dangerous of current economic problems. This was mentioned again uh, by Adrian Wood, and a good example of this is the salaries of top executives. I mean, ever since we know how much the top managers are being paid, the salaries of these uh, executives have uh, you know, been multiplied tenfold or a hundredfold. And the same with ice hockey players. I used to uh, write articles and books about uh, the National Hockey League. And uh, we, we found out that uh, the salaries of hockey players exploded in 1977. This was the first time that a list of all the salaries of all the professional hockey players was published. And that generated uh, salary inflation in the NHL. Okay, we can uh, contrast what I just said with the mainstream view. There are some similarities. Remember, I had ABC before. Well, we can have ABC also for the mainstream. So uh, about uh, conflictual inflation, there's something very similar in mainstream economics. Uh, if you look at the wage setting, price setting models that you can find in the textbooks of Blanchard, or Carlin and Soskise, or even discussed at the OECD. Uh, this is very close to the post keynesian view on, on conflictual inflation. The uh, imported inflation is usually mentioned under mainstream uh, economics with the words of supply shocks. What they use is supply shocks. Uh, but their main focus is usually on demand shocks. So the argu their argument is usually that, well, if there is inflation, it's either because there is an excess money supply, excess government expenditures or government deficits, rising inflation expenditures, expectations, and of course this uh, idea that there is a Nairu and a vertical Phillips curve. Um, yeah, uh, Blanchard in a discussion or interview uh, in, uh, interviewed by Branca Chio. This was in the Review of Political Economy in 2019, said, I have always seen the level of unemployment as reflecting in part a distributive struggle between workers and companies. So again, this looks very much like the notion of conflictual inflation, except that he's focusing on uh, unemployment or the, the natural rate of unemployment. Um, well, the, one could argue that the mainstream view, at least in the past, was that inflation is always a monetary phenomenon. Uh, and indeed, you know, you can find a relationship between the evolution of, say, the rate of growth of the money supply and the rate of growth of prices. But from our standpoint, from the post keynesian standpoint, this is just an example of reverse causality, because in post keynesian <laughs> economics, for us, money is endogenous, and therefore the way it should be read is that it's the, it's the increase in prices that, or output that generates 
the increase in uh, money demand and hence in the stock or the supply of money. Uh, however, we must certainly also be aware that, well, uh, you know, if you have more credit, then you have more expenditures. Uh, and so this may be a link with respect to uh, inflation or at least economic activity. In fact, I just read a paper uh, where the person was arguing that, uh, okay, now we cannot rely enough on money aggregates to explain inflation, let's rely on credit aggregates. So this was somebody, somebody, somebody from the Bank for International Settlements. Okay, so this was just an introduction. Sorry for those who arrived late because you missed the key uh, <laughs> diapo. <laughs> so here is now the outline. So again, I'm going to give some background information. Then I will focus more on some equations. First, within a closed economy. So I'll talk about the dot approach to conflictual inflation. Then I'll talk about wage-wage inflation and then add to it uh, the possibility of uh, increases in productivity. Uh, then I'll talk about the f more specifically about the Phillips curve. And so I'll start again with the dot approach, but this time including unemployment or unemployment rates. And then there is this other approach, which uh, one can call the Heinz stock hammer approach, which uses uh, or considers the existence of a NIRU, or a natural rate of an, uh, unemployment. And then I'll finish with the open economy, uh, take into account these imported raw materials that I was talking about, and then I'll finish off with uh, the idea of high or hyperinflation. Okay, so some background. Well, first, Conflictual inflation is everywhere, at, well, in post-Kindian books. <laughs> uh, all, all the important early, earlier post-Kindian works emphasize conflictual inflation. So here I, I have a list of them, uh, all books that have inspired me. Uh, well, mainly books. There's also the article in the Journal of Economic Literature by Alfred Eichner and Jan Kregel. But, you know, all these books, all the way to Tom Pally, I saw him there, uh, they, they all discuss inflation, uh, attributing it to some kind of conflict, uh, at, at least in part, uh, and, and often in great part. Um, and you can find statements, uh, I'll start with Joan Robinson, uh, then she says, um, when it's in italics, it's a direct statement from the person. So there is then a head-on conflict between the desire of entrepreneurs to invest and the refusal of the system to accept the level of real wages which the investment entails. Uh, and, and so what she has here is the inflation barrier. That's her, her, her notion that, you know, if the level of investment is too high, then it means that real wages have to be low. This is more like a Straffian uh, view, at least of the time. And so there is an inflation barrier. Uh, the, the entrepreneur will not accept uh, need to have lower real wages, but the, the workers refuse that. Um, Badouri, who uh, was uh, a, really a Kaleskian uh, post-Kindian, argued that this generates conflict rather than cooperation among the classes, which expresses itself through the inflationary process. This pushes the capitalist economy towards inflation, not only through the operation of an inflationary barrier. So there's not just inflationary barrier, it can go beyond that. Uh, in the 1970s, you have again similar statement. Paul Davidson saying, 
the distribution of income is both a cause and a consequence, uh, whoops, there's a S, and a consequence of inflationary processes. And uh, the article by Alfred Eichner and Kriegel that I mentioned, they argue in their survey of post Keynesian economics that at the heart of the inflationary process is the question of relative income distribution. And then below you have a statement by Robert Rothorn, a, a paper published in 1977 in the Cambridge Journal of Economics, and this is often taken to be the first clear presentation of conflictual inflation. And in fact, the Rothorn paper is now being cited by, a, a, I've seen a couple of mainstream authors, some of, some of them quite well known, who have, have been citing uh, Rothorn in their explanation of inflation. Um, and uh, then it just keeps on going uh, later. Uh, here, uh, Malcolm Sawyer, I, I saw him uh, at, during the lunch, he says, the view of inflation uh, often described as a conflict theory of inflation could be seen as a development of Kaliski's ideas. This is just what we saw. Uh, Cardim de Carvalho, uh, the well-known uh, Brazilian post-Keynesian, back, that's 30 years ago, said inflation should be seen as a process of conflict over income shares. And uh, Bur Burdekin and Burkett, uh, who are not as well known, but they have written many uh, papers, uh, in particular about the German hyperinflation episode, and they have a whole book about conflictual inflation. Uh, they say inflation is the symptom of deep-rooted social and economic contradiction and conflict. So, uh, it has always been there. Uh, I, I, and, and, uh, and on the other hand, there is this view that, well, aggregate demand may not play such a large role in explaining inflation. So here you have Cripps, uh, again in the Cambridge Journal, Journal of Economics, 1977, s claiming that excess demand provides at most only a minor component of a comprehensive explanation. John Cornwall, who is um, a, a Canadian who was in fact the supervisor of Mark Satterfield back in 1983, was claiming that uh, th he was saying this theory gives rise to horizontal short and long run Phillips curve. And uh, again, my former co author, Wynne Godley, saying, I do not accept that it is a foregone conclusion that inflation rates will be higher if unemployment is lower. And there's been a number of people. Uh, of post Keynesians who have argued that at least there is a middle segment in the Phillips curve which uh, is probably flat. And even uh, Lipsy, who is the, the one who mainly made popular the, the Phillips curve among uh, his neoclassical colleagues, has argued that there is a non-inflationary band of unemployment, which uh, looks, so it looks like this. He calls it the NIBU, non-inflationary inflation band of unemployment. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, uh, so, uh, so what? So when I when I did make my presentation at the University of Ottawa, I was asked to speak for one hour. They were desperate to hire someone uh, because it was very late in May, and they still were missing a professor. They told me if I can speak for one hour, they will hire me, which they did. <laughs> And uh, so you can start from a, a kind of a Markov equation, and uh, at, at the end you get what is written there with equation two, that the rate of growth of prices is equal to 
the proxy of the markup uh, plus uh, this second component, whoops, wrong button here. <laughs> so if we start from this, then it seems that there are two possible sources of inflation. Either there is an increase in the profit margin of firms for various reasons, or uh, it could be that there is an increase in nominal wages, which is faster than that of labor product productivity. But, you know, if K is a constant, does it mean that on, only the wages are responsible for inflation? And so Baduri says no. Uh, th there's a mutual feedback between prices and money wages that clearly makes it meaningless to single out either as a causal factor. So things are a little bit more complicated than just looking at the previous equations. And this is what uh, I will be doing in, in some of the following uh, slides. There's a, some kind of irony in how people interpret inflation in the sense that left-wing or heterodox uh, post-Keynesians usually tend to blame the unions for generating wage increases. And uh, even Keynes uh, was saying, well, uh, you know, in the long run, uh, it's what explains inflation is the differential between the rate of growth of wages and the rate of growth of labor productivity. Uh, whereas on the other side, mainstream authors usually blame the central bank. They say the central bank is creating too much money. So there is this funny thing uh, where the left economists uh, blame the unions and the uh, right-wing economists blame the central bank. And uh, there we go. Now that we have MMT saying that there is no problem in having deficits and uh, financing it through the creation of money, then you have politicians from uh, the, in, in the Senate, Republicans who are saying they were saying back in 2019, if uh, we keep following MMT, this will lead to higher deficits and higher inflation. And of course, it was said arg and argued again uh, in 2022. Um, what about profit inflation? Well, uh, it is compatible with the earlier Neo-Keynesian models or Cambridge models of growth, those though of Caldor, Pazinetti, and uh, John Robinson. And also it's consistent with the pricing models of uh, Eichner and Adrian Wood, because the, their argument was, well, the rate of profit is equal to the rate of growth of the economy divided by some uh, propensity to save. And so the, the other part of the in, uh, equation is that the rate of profit is equal to the rate uh, to the profit share times the rate of utilization divided by some capital to uh, capacity ratio. So uh, the argument is that if uh, firms want to uh, grow faster, then they will have to raise the profit share, their markups, and this will generate inflation. And as you can see in the second paragraph, there's, also, there's always have been a number of post-Keynesians who have made a similar claim. Uh, they would claim that if in investment activity uh, rises faster than consumption activity, this will lead to profit inflation. And so you can find these kind of statements in Weintraub, Hyman Minsky, Randy Ray, Augusto Graziani, and of course in the Treatise on Money of Keynes. And then some of them go uh, a bit further. They also argued that if there is a, an increase in the public deficit to GDP ratio, this would lead to an increase in the price of consumption goods. So this is a view which is not as uh, popular today, but it has existed through time. The Sraffians uh, and a, a number of other economists have you know, presented models like Lance Taylor, Eckert Hein, and so on, that increases in the real rate of interest 
will generate an increase in, say, the normal rate of profit, and therefore this would also mean uh, profit inflation. And of course, uh, today profit inflation is in the news. It, it is discussed uh, by central bankers, the IMF, many of, of our heterodox uh, colleagues, and in particular in the uh, paper by Isabella Weber and Wasner in the Review of Political or was it in the Review of Keynesian? Yes, yeah, sorry, in the Review of Keynesian Economics in 2023. I'm not going to talk anymore about profit inflation because I'm supposed to talk about it later in another session. Uh, okay, so how do we model all this? How do we model conflictual inflation? So we start with the dot approach. Um, but So there, there are two views, as I said. Either the view that there exists a Nairu and this is linked to the acceleration hypothesis, there, there would be a relationship between unexpected inflation and the rate of unemployment. So you can find this in Rothorn, Stockhammer, Hein and Stockhammer, and in the latest textbook by Eckhart Hein. And then there are others who tend to say that there is no Nairu, uh, but that there might be a relationship between now it's the rate of inflation, not unexpected inflation, but just inflation and the rate of unemployment. So you, you can see that lots of authors have taken this view uh, in the recent past. Okay, so what's the dot model? Here I take the equations from my uh, textbook. Uh, well, it simply says that wage inflation, so W hat is the rate of growth of wages, depends on the discrepancy between the wage target of workers and the actual, well, the real wage target of workers and the actual real wage of the previous period. And it also depends in some measure on past, the past rate of price inflation. And what about and then, in a symmetric way, uh, the rate of growth of price inflation, or, the, or price inflation, is the, equal to the discrepancy between the actual real wage, which we suppose to be bigger than the real wage target of firms. And it also depends on the, wage, the current wage inflation or the wage inflation of the previous period. And so from there you can compute what will be, that's the, yeah, that, that's the equilibrium real wage that will arise from these two equations. And this is the equilibrium, well, in the medium run, so to speak, when wage inflation and price inflation equal are equated, then you can see that it will mainly depend on the discrepancy between the real wage target of workers and the real wage target of firms, and it depends on these various parameters. Uh, everything here is expressed in terms of uh, wage shares or real wages, but you could also put this in terms of uh, markups or profit shares. Okay, here is a description of the inflation barrier of Joan Robinson. So uh, the, the, the real wage cannot go any lower than, uh, oops, than the target of the workers, so this means that my wage inflation curve is a straight line, and uh, and, and and so uh, organized labor here has the power to oppose any fall in the real wage rate. Usually, things are seen the other way around. It is believed that it is the firms that have the absolute bargaining power, in the sense that you know workers come negotiate their nominal wage. But then you figure, ah, the firms are not stupid. They're going to adjust the prices in, 
in, uh, in taking into consideration the wage rate which has been the nominal wage rate which has been set in, at the bargaining table. And then in that case, uh, the, the, the real wage that will be realized is the one targeted by the firms. And then we have the general case, which is this one, uh, where uh, neither the workers nor the firms are happy. The real wage is somewhere in between the, the two targets, the, tar the targets of the workers and the targets of the firms. Uh, and this will give rise in the medium run to the uh, a steady s situation in the sense that in the, the wage inflation is exactly equal to price inflation. And why is that? It's because if the real wage is bigger than this equilibrium real wage, then you can see that price inflation will be bigger than wage inflation. And so we're going to move in that direction. You know, the, the real wage will start decreasing because prices rise faster than wages. So, we'll, so this equilibrium is, uh, is a stable point. Uh, one may wonder why it is that uh, firms are unable exactly to achieve their target. And this is a question that uh, Tarling and Wilkinson, who were at the um, Department of Applied Economics at the University of Cambridge, this is the question they put to, to themselves. You know, why should distributional shares change in a system where wages are determined unilaterally by capitalists and where in the time sequence prices follow wages? So uh, th there must be reasons uh, for this, uh, for the, the fact that prices do not always follow wages or that firms face constraints. So, for instance, if there is foreign competition, well, uh, firms may be, domestic firms may be unable to raise prices because they have to compete with foreign companies. Uh, also, another reason is that not all firms are homogeneous, so the less productive or efficient firms may not be able to follow what the more productive firms uh, are, are doing wi with their wages. Uh, firms may have to publish price lists in advance. That's, uh, that's something we know. Or there could be a lag period between the increase in cost and the increase in prices. So this is called historical cost pricing. And uh, Godley and Cripps, uh, Godley, Cripps, uh, Godley, Coots, and Nordhaus also uh, had uh, this uh, studied in quite extensive terms in the 1970s. Uh, so what, what happens within this model if uh, workers suddenly decide that, oh, we would like to have a higher target and we will do everything to negotiate it? Well, according to the model, this should lead to, uh, indeed, a higher real wage, but it will also lead to a higher rate of uh, price inflation and price and wage inflation. In fact, Kaletsky uh, recognized this uh, in his book in 1971. Uh, what would governments, uh, I mean, governments keep telling firms today that, oh, uh, you guys shouldn't be abusing the market. So really, uh, you know, that uh, firms are in part responsible for the increase in the rate of inflation. So in the term of this model, the way we can interpret it is that the government is telling the firms, well, you guys should accept to have a, a higher real wage target, or if you want, a lower profit margin or lower markup, which means that the price inflation uh, line would shift down, and this would mean that we would get 
a higher real wage, but a lower rate of inflation. So if you wind up with a higher real wage, it may lead to a higher rate of inflation or it may lead to a lower rate of inflation depending on who is making the move. Okay, uh, wage rate, inflation and productivity growth. So uh, already, I've already mentioned that for Keynes, uh, protecting the relative real wage is something very important. John Robinson said in 1962, the causes of movements in money wages are bound up with the competition of different groups of workers to maintain or improve their relative position. But the one who insisted the most about wage wage inflation is Richard Kahn. The main cause of inflation is the competitive struggle between trade unions and different sections of labor. I was on the bargaining uh, committee of my university, of my uh, you, uh, prof you, uh, professor's association at the University of Ottawa uh, for two bargaining uh, sessions. And uh, in, on both occasions, uh, we, we hardly spent any time discussing past inflation or expected inflation. Well, maybe five minutes uh, in negotiations that would last uh, dozens of hours. But we, we would spend uh, 10, 12, 15 hours discussing how our wages at the University of Ottawa could be compared with the salaries of other universities in Canada of a similar size. This is where we spent all of our time and uh, also getting the data. So wage-wage inflation is something uh, important and this has been recognized by some of these other authors and also by people in industrial relations. Oops, uh, yeah. Wage-wage inflation. Well, even if, so if we look at this line here and that line, uh, so that's my, wage inflation line, but without wage-wage inflation, even if uh, the, the workers and the firms agree on the same real wage target, because there is this term here which represents wage-wage inflation, then what will happen is that we will wind up with price inflation, even if workers and firms agree on the same real wage Target. So wage-wage inflation, in my view, is important. But then we also have productivity-led inflation. So here you have a statement by Amit Badouri, who argues that, uh, yeah, uh, if there is productivity increases in some industries, this, this will probably lead to wage uh, increases in those industries, but the other industries, even if they don't have productivity increases, will do the same. And so uh, you have a propagation effect of a wage-wage spiral which tries to restore the relative money wage structure. And uh, John Hicks also emphasized that. So you can use the same equations, but now you just, so this was the wage inflation term, and this is the productivity inflation term. So, uh, and, uh, so the wage inflation will be higher because of this productivity term. And firms will pass on to consumers only part of the productivity gain. So in, in, they will reduce prices, but only in part due to the productivity gains. And so in the end, you can see that uh, the real wage will depend on this uh, term here that relates uh, to the rate of growth of productivity. Uh, and this has been discussed by the French Regulation School, where they consider does an increase in productivity lead to uh, a bigger wage share? In, in which, if it does, then they call this the Fordist regime. They, they argued that this was the case in the 60s. 
but otherwise, uh, we have an anti for, for this regime. And Robert Boyer has been uh, explaining this in great detail. Um, so here what happens is that now we need wage inflation, which is here, to be equal to price inflation plus the rate of growth of labor productivity. So the, there are more curves around, more confusion, studies, uh, students love this. <laughs> <laughs> and so do you, I'm sure. Okay, the Phillips curve. Uh, so we start with the dot approach to the Phillips curve. In fact, nothing is changing. We just add this component here. We are saying that the real wage target is a function of something. It's a function of the rate of unemployment. So the higher the rate of unemployment, the lower will be the real wage target. And so you can play around with these uh, equations. And at the end, uh, well, you get something very, uh, an, an equation that defines wage inflation in a very similar way as before. You know, it, of course, it still depends on the discrepancy between the real wage target of mm -hmm. workers and that of firms. And in the long run, uh, what you get assuming that the price inflation today is the same as price inflation yesterday. In the long run, you get a downward sloping Phillips curve. And even if firms have the upper hand, meaning that uh, Psi 2, uh, where is it, Psi 2 here, so the it's kind of a coefficient of indexation, uh, even if it's equal to 1, meaning that the firms have the power to set the real wage. So not, not much is, is being changed from what I said before. It's just that we obtain a short-run Phillips curve, which is downward sloping, but the long-run Phillips curve is also downward sloping. Now, in the Heinz Stockhammer Nairo approach, well, I, I looked at many of their different ways of presenting it. And I, I thought that the, I recommend for you that the clearest presentation can be found in the paper of Eckhart Hein in Egypt. You know that Egypt now is completely free of access. You can all access all papers that were published in the European Journal of Economics and Economic Policies. So uh, there I found it, it was quite clear. So this is how... He writes it. The key, key thing is that there is full indexation. When wage, wages fully react to the change, well, to the level of inflation of the previous period, and similarly, uh, the firms fully react to uh, the change in wages of the period. So. In terms of the dot model that we had before, psi 2 and omega 2 are both equal to, run, to 1. So that in the long run, what uh, we get is, uh, well, first, this implies that the, real, the actual real wage will be exactly equal to the real wage targeted by the firms. But it also implies the existence of a Nairu, which is identical to the Nai well, na uh, yeah, identical to the Nairu that you would find in the book of Blanchard, and it's equal to this. It's equal to the discrepancy between the real wage target of of workers if there was zero unemployment, and the real wage target of firms divided by alpha 1, which is this coefficient here in front of the rate of utilization. Oops, again, wrong thing. So, uh, yeah, so basically, uh, in, in the Heinz-Stockhammer approach, 
the long run equilibrium is reached only when the two real wage targets are equated. They are equated thanks to the change in the rate of unemployment. Out of equilibrium, there is unexpected inflation, or if you want, within the period, the rate of inflation will be changing. And, uh, and then what you have is a relation, is a, you have this a negative relationship, not between inflation and unemployment, but between unexpected inflation and unemployment. So this is very similar to the mainstream view. The only difference is that they have various explanations to explain why the Nairu is endogenous in their model. So the model is more complicated and uh, possibly unstable. Okay, so I have about uh, oof, maybe 10 minutes to talk about uh, how do we model it within the open economy. Uh, within the open economy, we have to take into account imported intermediary goods or imported raw materials. And so um, if we're looking at unit direct costs, we have to take into account not only unit direct labor cost, but also unit material cost. And so the equation that you that you would get if we're, we are in this uh, vertically integrated economy where there, some of the materials are being, are being uh, imported, uh, then the price will be equal to one plus the percentage markup times the unit direct labor cost plus the unit material cost, and this uh, unit Material cost is made up of three components. It depends on the exchange rate, it depends on the foreign price of these materials, and it depends on the uh, a ratio, the material to unit, uh, to, to the, the unit material to output ratio. Uh, so, uh, right, so uh, you can find these ideas all already in the book of Reynolds. It's a book that uh, is not very well known. It was published in 1989, but it's an excellent, uh, if you start w learning about post keynesian economics, it, it's still very good. And, it, and the algebra is based, in fact, on Hein and Vogel and the latest book by Hein. So as I said, if there is the increase in the cost of imported materials may not depend on three factors, a depreciation of the exchange rate, a rise in the prices of commodities, and uh, dep can depend on an increase in, uh, an increase, an increase, no oh, good, an increase in the real amount of imported raw materials, which is required per unit of production. So, I mean, what did, I mean, basically over the last two years, this is what we had. You know, we had to suffer this, uh, this increase. And, uh, yeah, surveys showed that the most frequent reason for price increases is the change in material cost. And, and then this is followed by changes in labor cost. So uh, Kutz and Norman, in their very interesting uh, chapter, uh, say that cost movements always lead to price adjustments in the same direction. If everybody sees that the costs are rising, well, all the firms in that industry will agree to raise their prices. And a pass-through of 100% is likely in the case of cost increases in intermediary goods the prices of which are determined in the world market. And uh, according to Bloch and, and all in 2004, even in the US, there is a complete pass-through of inflation from input prices to inflation in finished goods. Okay, so, uh, yeah. I mean, to simplify, so now we have the same equation as we had in the very simple uh, post Keynesian view that I presented at the beginning, except now we have an additional term. 
this term here, which represents J representing the ratio uh, the, uh, here, the ratio of unit material cost to unit direct labor cost. And again, this is what we had to face uh, as a follow-up to the COVID and the war in Ukraine. So what if the unit material cost rises faster than the unit direct labor cost? Well, what will happen is that this is my profit share. And uh, what will happen if that, is that if J, so this ratio unit material cost to unit direct labor cost, if it goes up, then the profit share will go up. And this was recognized by Kalecki. He says, a rise in the degree of monopoly or in raw material prices in relation to unit wage costs causes a fall in the relative share of wages in value added. So you can see it here. You can see the real wage is a negative function of this J variable, which measures how important is material cost relative to labor cost. So that's how it looks uh, right. And so what, that will be the impact on the economy. Uh, we start from the two red lines, wage inflation, price inflation. And if there is this increase in the cost of material cost, uh, unit material cost, then the real wage being targeted by firms will be smaller than it used to be. This will lead to a reduction in the real wage, and it will lead to an increase in price inflation. Um, there is a slightly different thing uh, which has been presented by Moore Lin, who uh, is a young scholar. So he has uh, two sectors, one which produces investment, which he considers to be the tradable good, and then there is a consumption good, which is non-tradable. And he assumes that the tradable good is uh, subjected to the law of one price that it depends on world prices. So, and then he also assumes that, uh, in a Sraffian way, that the rate of uh, profit is uniform, is the same in both sectors. And, uh, and then what you can see uh, what happens here, the rate of profit in the investment tradable sector will be equal to this expression. And you can see that if there is uh, an increase in uh, E, so a currency depreciation means an increase in E. So this term here is bigger, the whole term is smaller, but there's a minus sign. So the rate of profit in the tradable investment sector will be, uh, well, the price will be higher, but also uh, the rate of profit will be higher. And therefore, the rate of profit that will be uh, imposed on the consumption goods sector will also be higher. And this will lead to a fall in the real wage, where the real wage is W divided by PC, PC being the consumption good. So we get exactly the same result as we had in the Kaliskian uh, model. As in the Kaliskian model, currency depreciation generates a rise in the inflation rate and a fall in the realized real wage. Okay, uh, a, a few more slides. What about uh, high and hyperinflation, which is a concern in many semi-industrialized or developing uh, countries? So for mainstream economists, the answer is very simple, too much money supply. Uh, but in post-Keynesian economics, there is a, a, a long-held tradition that says otherwise. So for post-Keynesians, high and hyperinflation are, again, the consequence of a distributive conflict, uh, usually following a strong external negative shock. So a, a depreciation of the currency for whatever reason, 
And this was the explanation of John Robinson for the German hyperinflation. And this explanation has been picked up by several uh, authors in, in the more recently, including Ber Burdekin and Ber Ber Burkett. Uh, here I have a statement by Camara and Verningo from a book, uh, from a chapter in a book that was published uh, 20 years ago. Um, so what they say is that uh, with the collapse of the mark in 1921, import prices rose uh, abrupt, abruptly. So there was a sudden rise in the cost of living led to an urgent demand for higher wages. Uh, rising wages uh, countered the effect of exchange rate depreciation in stimulating exports. Each rise in wages therefore precipitated a further fall in the exchange rate, and so on. Um, and then, you know, there was indexation and all that. So, um, Bastian and Sutterfield have tried to uh, formalize this a bit. What they have argued is that when the real wage target is too far from the actual real wage, then uh, the, uh, well, there will be faster indexation, there will be uh, faster renegotiation of the bargaining. And, but this, however, may uh, lead firms to decide to retaliate and react more strongly to change in wage inflation. So they will also speed up the, well, they, they, will, uh, they will change prices more frequently, more often, and this will lead to an acceleration of inflation. So we have both curves that will be shifting, and therefore we don't know exactly what happens to the real wage, but for sure we know that price inflation will be much higher than before. And then how do we move towards hyperinflation? It's when firms, instead of setting prices as a function of actual cost or as a function of past costs, start thinking about setting prices as a function of expected future cost. And, but then what is the thing that they will use in order to assess future cost? Well, they think it all depends a lot on the evolution of the exchange rate. And uh, this is what Carvalho uh, said in his book in 1992. Uh, at, at, how will, you know, the, you will get ever shorter adjustment periods, you know, as everybody is indexing. So the new adjustment index that then becomes the exchange rate to the dollar. So the wage inflation you can write in this way. Now you add an, an extra parameter which says that wages and prices, uh, prices also, uh, will also uh, change, or wage inflation, price inflation will increase uh, in line with the rate of growth of depreciation. So that's the beginning of the end for these countries. Uh, and I think that's my last slide. Thank you. So, questions? <laughs> Is there a microphone Okay, so thank you, uh, Mark, for the insightful lecture. Uh, so for those of us used to engaging with the uh, mainstream economists, it's very refreshing to hear a lecture on inflation that doesn't mention the word uh, nominal rigidities a single time. Uh, so I was, you know, I'm, I'm kind of very curious on 
what do you think is the role of nominal rigidities in the post-Keynesian theory of inflation, right? If I recall correctly, uh, in the Rothern article in 1977, he derives his wage equation and like the omega one parameter is a function of the number of times uh, that uh, wages are bargaining in a, in a single year. So he does seem to assume some wage rigidities. Um, and it also, I, I don't know if you're aware of this, but uh, Werning and Lorenzini, so two MIT economists, just published a paper called uh, Conflict is Inflation, which is basically follows the, the standard uh, post keynesian model. But they argue that these omegas, right, that you presented are a function of nominal rigidities. So in their, in their paper, when you get to a flexible price equilibrium, kind of conflict inflation disappears, right? So I wonder... What, what is the interaction between nominal rigidities and conflict inflation? Do you see this as central to a sound theory of inflation, or do you think that everything you said holds uh, in an economy with flexible prices? Thank you. Okay, I'm not sure I understood the question, but uh, I, you know, I, if I understood well and if I can give a reasonable answer, basically I would say that uh, yeah indexation is something which is likely to accelerate inflation so on the one hand indexation looks like a great idea because at least when inflation changes uh, wages can follow suit so you don't lose but in general, you would like wages to grow faster than prices because you, know, you, you would hope that the economy has some increase in labor productivity. So in indexing wages to prices under some circumstances may not be such a good idea. And just to give an example, you know, everybody's talking about uh, inflation targeting 2% in Europe, in the US. But if labor trade unions focus on this 2% and only ask for 2%, then they're losing out, you know, because with, if there is labor productivity, they should be asking for more than 2%. And, and in general, uh, indexation by many post keynesian or heterodox economists is considered to be uh, a dangerous mean towards rising inflation. You know? uh, Lance Taylor, Wynne Godley, all these people have taken this position. Maybe, no. Oh. Hi, Professor. Thank you for that. Uh... Can you speak up? Because, yeah. yeah, hi. Uh, so uh, thanks for the presentation. I just wanted to ask something. Uh, so we talk a lot about markups and monopoly, and uh, there is some literature coming from the mainstream uh, which talks about monopsony or labor market concentration. Is there anything uh, or any existing post-Keynesian framework which looks at how labor market concentration might affect uh, inflation or income distribution? Uh, thanks. Well, uh, in, um, among post Keynesian economists as such, perhaps not that much, but uh, among people who, you know, people who are looking in industri industrial relations uh, or former labor economists, yes, yeah, certainly they, they, they did discuss... Uh, uh, you know the the importance of some trade unions being the the leader, or uh, but you know I'm not too good about this. Uh, I mean that that would be my the only thing I could say about uh, monopoly. Alfred Eichner had uh, a chapter I think in his uh, book 1987 devoted to the role of these. Uh, he had a, 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 you know, like labor unions setting benchmarks for price increases, for wage increases, and so on. But I, I cannot say more. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. I know a lot of things, but not everything. <laughs> 
Okay, Professor Lavoie, so thank you for your interesting conference. You know, I really love uh, mathematics, you know, so I appreciate the fact that you use them quite a lot. But nevertheless, you know, I have some slight doubts, you know, so I'm going to take a little bit of aim at you. I really hope that you don't mind. You know, in the sense that, uh, you know, when you were speaking particularly, you know, about wage-wage uh, spiral, you know, and uh, you were talking about, you know, uh, like a real target, you know, like uh, uh, about real wages, you know, but uh, of course, you know, I mean, mathematically speaking, you know, it's, uh, I mean, it's a beautiful model, you know, on a theoretical level, you know, but it's uh, really complicated, as you surely must know, you know, to come with an analytical solution, you know, to this problem, you know, and then, uh, you know, another thing that I really wanted to comment on, you know, I think that, um, you know, in your conference, which is otherwise great, you know, but, um, you know, at times I think that perhaps, you know, productivity, you know, should be taken, um, uh, you know, a little bit more into consideration, because, you know, uh, during the last uh, 30, 40 years, you know, there has been, uh, you know, a really important growth in productivity, you know, and uh, actually, you know, the inflationary, uh, you know, episodes, you know, that we had, you know, when mostly linked, you know, to exogenous factors, but of course, you know, I do not say exogenous factors like in this kind of neoclassical way, but rather, for example, like uh, uh, some of the facts that you mentioned, like the war in Ukraine, for instance, you know, the growing financialization, you know, of the economy, you know, I'm speaking, you know, I'm referring to this, uh, you know, commenting, you know, in the line of Michael Hudson, for example, you know, I really appreciate his work, you know, so, so you know, so just, uh, you know, if, you, if you'd like to comment a little bit, you know, on what I'm saying, you know, just your thoughts. Thank yeah. You. Uh, I can't get this out. Um, well, I'm not sure what the question is exactly. <laughs> uh, So let me repeat. I mean, so first of all, I mean, so I think that, uh, you know, there should be more focus on productivity. I mean, you know, you know, that is one point. And then, you know, when we speak, you know, about real wages, you know, so in mathematical terms, I mean, we usually can come up with an expected value, you know, in mathematical terms, you know, but it's really hard, you know, to find an analytical solution, you know, for the theoretical models, okay. you know. Okay, well, if I can comment uh, here, of course, these are models. We assume that we can <clears throat> easily compute what the real wage is. We can, that we can even say something about the real wage target, or we can say something <clears throat> about the average productivity level. But in, in reality, things are quite complicated. Uh, and we had a very good example during the COVID, where in the second quarter of 2020, the real wage exploded up. Uh, but the, the reason for this was simply because all these restaurants, hotels, all these services were just closed down. And so all the, the wages in these services is very low compared to what it is in manufacturing or uh, other occupations. And the same with respect to labor productivity. The labor productivity jumped up in 2020 second quarter. And uh, I've said this in, uh, when I was in Brazil in July, but this creates great difficulties for macroeconomists because usually when the level of output falls as it did in the second quarter of 2020, well, uh, labor productivity goes deeply down. But during the COVID, it suddenly went up. So anybody doing empirical work in the near future, like some of you, uh, will have a very hard time dealing with that quarter. <laughs> yeah, next question. Sorry, I can't say more. Who has the, or who wants to speak, ask a question? Uh, thank you so much for your lecture. Uh, really enjoyed it, especially the, the last uh, remarks from you about hyperinflation. And uh, what I found, like your argument about um, that firms are moving from the, to price their goods in future expected costs. Um, it doesn't that align with the mainstream view of inflation expectations. So is, is, would you agree or is that 
um, can we connect these two things, that the mainstream approach to inflation expectations is more closely linked to a hyperinflation scenario than to a real world and normal time scenario? Would you agree on that? Yes, uh, I agree. I, I also realize that, you know, the new Keynesian equation is always telling us that uh, level of prices today depends on the level of prices tomorrow. I always found that bizarre, to say the least. But yes, it fits well uh, the situation of a country in a hyperinflation. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, how would you connect maybe the market theory, which is more based on unit costs, to the uh, salaries of top executives, where you find the link there? Uh, can you just repeat? Uh, like the market theory is more based on unit costs? Yeah. And just link this to the salaries of top executives? Do you see my point? No. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, like, unit costs are more based on production, but still there's a markup happening, and the markup will be like... A, all along, obviously, on workers as well with wages, but at the same time, you still have like the uh, salaries of top executives, and I think like there's um, there's a link missing somehow from the one like more micro based, and the other one is more on the aggregate way. Like, what is the profit share of the top executives? What is the profit share of the top executives, and how is top it executives? to the markup? Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I really don't. I mean, <laughs> please talk to me afterwards <laughs> because I, I can't. I, I don't get uh, what you mean. Thank you for your presentation. Since the Verning conflict inflation paper was already mentioned, I was wondering about your thoughts about. So the mainstream, and I mean, Vernon posted on Twitter that he engaged with Rothorn and uh, writing this paper. And yeah, what do you generally think about these interactions of mainstream New Keynesian frameworks capturing post-Keynesian ideas, and then yeah, even talking about and referencing it? Do you think that's a good development and could be could lead to a fruitful exchange, or is it rather taking some ideas away and then sort of bastardizing them? Well, uh, yes, uh, I've discussed this, uh, the fact that some of our views on uh, conflictual inflation has been picked up by a, a couple of mainstream authors. Uh, I've discussed this with, I, I have uh, a couple of colleagues who thought, oh no, what is he, what is these guys doing? Uh, but I, I have a different view. Uh, I think it, it, it's fine, you know. It's just that uh, they, they use the concept but present it in a completely different way and then introduce rational expectations. And, but I think for us, the, the more they do cite or refer to our work, uh, the better, of course. Uh, maybe, it, you know, some... Uh, Mainstream students will read those papers and 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 you know try to find what is this uh, Rotorn thing? What is this uh, uh, paper that was published? I don't know in the Cambridge Journal of Economics, and they will, they will discover the whole post-Keynesian literature. I, I see it a little bit like uh, MMT, you know MMT having such a, an, I mean, a lot of students, have, maybe some of you here, have discovered post-Kinsian economics by reading MMT blogs. So it, it can only be a, a good thing. Yeah. Hi, thank you for the presentation. Um, I would like to ask you if, it is, if it is, there is a role for misconduct of policy I don't know, a wrong monetary policy or wrong fiscal policy in this scheme that can activate maybe the, like this mechanism of wage and, and prices spirals, or is it not a place for that? Uh, I'm, I'm, well, what activates it, in my view, is uh, what's happening at the world level on the, you know, the aggregate world demand for these commodities. I think this is the, uh, you know, in, in 2008, the inflation rate in the US and in Canada, at least, I don't, was uh, starting to rise. 
And then I was, you know, it was starting to go up. Instead of 2%, it was more like 3.5%. And I was wondering, aha, you know, what is the Bank of Canada going to do? How are they going to manage to stop the inflation from being so high? And then we had the financial crisis. So, ooh, you know, the inflation rate went down. And then I was thinking, haha, what is the Bank of Canada going to do to, <laughs> to get the rate inflation from zero back to 2%? Well, what they did is that in, in other countries as well, you know, they, they, they set interest rates around 0%. Uh, yeah. So I, I think, uh, uh, as I said in one of the slides, I really think that a lot of the inflation is generated by the, what happens at the world level with respect to you know, oil prices and, and, and so on, raw materials, some of the food prices, yeah. Yes. Well, no, you're supposed to let uh, <laughs> younger ones first, but... Okay, well, well unless... unless the yes. Well, Sorry. I think I'll quickly go ahead and then, <laughs> yeah, we can move on for sure. Um, yeah, as one of the aforementioned, well, younger people who then discovered post-Keynesian economics by reading MMT blogs. What I would be very curious about is that uh, with MMT, there's a big string of literature where they identify the government as the source of the price level and then would uh, say, well, particularly with these hyperinflation cases, um, the the thing that is going on there is that the government is then issuing far more currency, say, for labor, and that then sort of um, lets the price level increase. And I wanted to ask generally what's your view on that and how can that maybe be integrated into a post-Keynesian approach? Does that fit in sort of a broad tent or what's, how can one have a dialogue there between those people and the Nairu people? I'd be pretty curious to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, well, I have some difficulties uh, in uh, taking on board this kind of uh, fiscal theory of the price level, which is advocated by some mainstream authors and also by uh, at least some MMT authors. Uh, you know, I have, have some doubt. I mean, the, the examples which are usually being given is something like, Haha, ha, let's imagine a world in which uh, the only money that can be created is created by the government and you have to pay taxes. So everybody is, is being forced to pay, say, 1,000 euros of taxes. And, uh, and the only way to get the money is to work for the government or to provide some services to the government. And so if the government is telling you, ah, uh, if you work 50 hours for us, then we will consider that your taxes have been paid. And so there you go. Now the wage level has been set at 20, 20 euros uh, an hour, and then the price level would be uh, close to that 20 euro, euros. Uh, you know, it's based on some you know, overly highly simplified view of the world. So I, I, I don't, no, I don't buy it, you know, basically. Yeah. Not that one. <laughs> well, Tom. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Thanks. Uh, Mark, my, my, my question is um, vis a vis. Blanchard's Twitter thread from 2022, when he sort of said that uh, all inflation is conflict inflation. So sort of conflict inflation is the only inflation. Do you agree with that, or do you think there are other types of inflation? Well, I, I think in a way, OK, so the question, did you understand the question? Uh, all inflation, it would be conflict inflation. Well, I, I, I tried to emphasize that, uh, no, a lot of the inflation comes from uh, an, an, an overall increase in world aggregate demand for these commodities that do not face a flat supply curve. 
So that, that would be my main uh, cause of concern for inflation, in, in, say, in general. So it's not, although one could argue, which was the claim of Silos Labini or Silos Labini? Silos Labini, Silos Labini, who says that, well, there are a conflict between three agents, the wage earners, the industrialists, and the producers of raw material. So in that case, <laughs> we could say, oh yeah, well, it is still a conflict, but with the producers of raw materials. Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, Mark, uh, you know, some of the colleagues, you know, touched upon uh, the MMT theory. So I think, you know, it's uh, perfectly valid, you know, in many senses. I just, uh, you know, would like to know your opinion. You know, this is something that Yanis Varoufakis, you know, has been discussing quite recently. Uh, you know, it's uh, about the role, you know, of the debt and the trade war, you know, that uh, the United States, you know, has with uh, China. You know, so because, you know, uh, China has a large swath of both uh, public and private debt, you know, of the United States. So how do you see this whole situation evolving in the future? Okay, so I, if I understand the question, the question is about uh, is there any problem with China holding the U.S. debt? Is that what you're saying? Or? Yeah, because, I mean, I mean, not the fact that it holds. I mean, that is perfectly okay because, yeah. uh, I mean, the United States is a sovereign nation. It has its currency. I mean, there is no problem with that. Yeah. But the problem, you know, may perhaps come, you know, that is just a hypothesis. Us, but the United States, you know, engages in a trade war with uh, China. So, so there, you know, there would become, you know, okay, so, China, so the, China like uh, trying to hit back, you know, I mean, uh, on the debt scene. You know, don't you see without, you know, a possible cause for concern? Okay, so it, the, it seems to, the question is, what if the U.S. gets in a trade war with China, and then China will do what uh, with the debt? <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, 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 okay. Well, I, I have written a paper with a Chinese uh, f former grad student on uh, the term being used is the diversification of the debt. So the, the paper was a stock flow consistent model and we, we were trying to figure what will happen in a three country world, so US, China, the rest of the world, if the Chinese decide that they don't want to hold so much or a smaller share of their debt in American dollars or from the US and now want to hold more euros. They want to hold their debt in euros. Well, what will happen is that uh, this will be highly beneficial to the US uh, because the their, if I remember well, their exchange rate will depreciate. It will allow them to export more stuff to the Eurozone. And in the Eurozone, their exchange rate will appreciate and they will go into uh, a slowdown. <laughs> so, uh, and the, this issue of, of diversification was discussed a lot maybe 10 years ago when we wrote the paper, but it had also been discussed a lot 30 years ago when the American dollar was not seen so much as such a safe currency. So it, it's, not, uh, it's not in the interest of the Chinese to get rid of their American debt. So if they... My book has been translated into Chinese, the one with Win Godly, so <laughs> if some official has read it, then <laughs> they, they will not get rid of their American debt. <laughs> okay, I guess uh, it's 2.30, so thank you very much.